are some implications of his theory of knowledge. Uh, number one, that uh, impressions have priority in the order of knowledge uh, because impression is one of the sources of knowledge, the basis of knowledge. And that impressions, they force themselves on us in such a way that our consciousness can only possibly receive them. So we receive the impressions. Our mind receives the impressions. So there's nothing we can do except to receive these uh, impressions. Uh, next is that ideas, in contrast, are faint and derivative copies. If we can trace an idea back to its corresponding impression, then its credentials are validated, meaning uh, ideas are copies of the impressions. So, for example, you are listening to my lecture right now. The voice that you can hear, the lecture that you can hear, this is impression. And impressions are vivid because they're actual representation of the object. Now, after this discussion, if we still remember our discussion, then that would be the idea. So the idea are faint copies of impressions. You're eating right now, the taste of the food is the impression. So we receive the impression. After eating, you try to remember the taste of the food. Then the taste of the food is the idea. So it's derivative. So if we have an idea of something, if we can have a remembrance of something, like for example, you have the idea of, uh, say, they have an idea of a beautiful, a beautiful uh, picture or a beautiful scene or scenery. If you can trace that back to an original impression, to the scene itself, then the idea is validated. So there are two kinds of uh, sources of our knowledge the impressions which are the you know the actual the actual impressions the, the actual taste okay uh, and the idea which are faint derivative copies of the impressions so any philosophical term or notion that cannot be tied to an original impression is empty and useless and it does not have the faint content of a legitimate idea so think, for example, of any notion, like, for example, think of the idea of God. If you cannot tie this idea of God, an original impression, to your actual experience of God, then that idea of God is useless. It will not have the content of a legitimate idea. But if you have an idea, for example, of the sun, sun shining, etc., the the characteristics of the properties of the sun, and you can trace back that idea of the sun as having this in that property, then the idea of sun is a legitimate idea. Your knowledge is legitimate. Okay? But if there's no corresponding impression, if you cannot trace it back to an original impression, then any philosophical notion or concept or whatever will be an empty and useless idea. Okay? So, the force of habit. Impressions succeed one another with a certain constancy. So, for example, every time I have drawn near the stove, I have felt warm. Every time I go out of the, go out in the morning and the sun is shining very brightly, then I feel the the hot, no, the hot weather or the hot temperature of the sun. Or every time I drink uh, a a soft drink straight from the freezer, then I I have this impression of the of the cold and you know a chilling uh, effect of the soft drinks. So they force the impression forced their way to us. So and they succeed one after the other. Okay. So every time I the first time I take a uh, an uh, an ice cold the ice cold soft drinks, I have this impression of its you know chill. Effect, coldness. So I will always uh, do. I will always experience that impression every time I drink an uh, an ice cold soft drink. So this realization, experience in the past of having observed one phenomenon constantly united with another. So uh, the 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 warm I feel when I get near the stove. The 
the cold, uh, uh, the hot temperature when you go out of uh, up the house during hot summer, or the the, the cold uh, if the cold uh, effect cessation of soft drinks, okay, and they give rise to the habit of my expecting also in the future a repetition of what has happened in the past. So I will always have to expect that every time I get an ice cold soft drinks, then I will have this impression. I will always have the impress, uh, expectation that every time I go out of the house during hot summer, then I will be perspiring and I will be feeling the heat of the sun. So there is that expectation. Okay. Uh, so I have a trusting expectancy of the second. Okay, so the first is the in, the hot uh, summer and the you know the feeling of this hot, uh, the being drawn near the stove, the feeling of warm, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so every time I approach the stove, from a force of habit, I expect it to be warm. Every time I get a uh, ice cold service in the uh, in the fridge, it will be uh, chilling cold. Every time I go out of the house during summer i will be perspiring and so on and so forth that's the force of habit so force of habit gives us the constancy of the phenomenon experienced in the past the force of metaphysical necessity so the force of habit now it's it translates into a metaphysical necessity and from it results the concept of the many different concepts that we have in philosophy like substance or the laws which govern sub-substances. In short, the resulting term in philosophy and science. So think of this in a large scale. Then, every time we have this, then it gives us a force of habit. So every time that you hear philosophy, they talk about substance. So now you get a force of all philosophy. It will talk about substance, etc., etc. Okay? So that's what habit can do to us. So, Jung admits only two instances of absolute certainty. One, the certainty found in factual things when we limit ourselves to the verification and description of facts expressed to the verification, I'm sorry, expressed by actual past or present sensation and disregard those which will be presented in the future. So, certainty found in factual things. Okay, but we have to limit that to those things, okay, to those facts expressed by actual sensation, whether past or present. Okay. Thus, an object is seen next to another or after another. And these spatial and temporal relationships included in impressions are certain. So, I am like certain that some given impressions have been constantly correlated in the past. For example, when one ball struck another, the next ball, the one that is struck, will be will move. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's absolute certainty. Okay, so uh, one thing following another thing. Okay. Now, the second is a certainty found in the relationship between ideas. So. If we assume that ideas retain their identity, then the relationship between them will be constant. So the first certainty is based on relations, matters of facts, this one, matters of facts. And the second is relations of ideas. Okay? So on these relationships depend the universality and necessity of mathematical demonstration which shows us the relations between ideas that are immutable in the abstract. Meaning those ideas whose logical value does not depend on the objects that correspond to them. So for example, we understand the idea of, for example, of addition, putting two uh, quantities together will increase, will result to an added quantity. Okay, so for example, if you add 2 and 3, 2 plus 3, it will be 5. So meaning the plus sign there, the addition there, simply puts that you combine the value of the two things and then it will be added. Regardless 
whether the two represents a particular object or three represents a particular object. So that's that is certain. So mathematical principles, mathematical uh, demonstrations, they are based on these relations of ideas, and we can find certitude in them. Okay, so outside of these two types, there is no certitude, whether philosophical or scientific, strong enough to exclude all doubt. So we cannot doubt this, we cannot doubt uh, the certitude based on the relationship of ideas, and we cannot doubt the certitude based on the, uh, the, uh, the facts. All other else, we can always doubt. Okay, we can always doubt them. So we can always doubt any of the concepts, philosophical or scientific concepts, that are outside of this certitude. Okay? So, now let's go to investigation of metaphysics and science. Jung's criticism aimed at the deconstruction of the concept of space and time, of material and spiritual substance, of the principle of causality, all of which are essential to philosophy and science. So he was critical of these concepts. So again, the basis of this is the question about is there an original experience or impressions huh, to which we can trace our conceptions? Because if you cannot trace our conceptions, philosophical or scientific, to an impression, then we will not that concept, that notion is empty and useless. So among Jung's criticisms, the most famous historically is his critique of the principle of causality. Okay? But of course, he was also critical of the substances. So let's take his criticism of the concept of cause and effect. The principle of causality consists in a relationship of necessary connection. So I emphasize necessary connection between cause and effect. In virtue of which, one, the effect cannot be without the presence of another, the cause. So the effect follows from the cause. And there is a necessary connection between cause and effect. Okay? So this is the formulation of the principle of causality. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause for its own existence. So anything that begins to exist, an effect that exists must have a cause. Okay, so it depends on the existence of another, which is the cause itself. This principle or this absolute necessity of connection between effect and its cause is anything but except, except from doubt. That's the take of David Hume. We can always doubt the absolute connection between effect and cause. Okay? So what David Hume is criticizing is the idea of the absolute connection between or necessary connection between the cause and the effect. So when you say absolute connection, that means that every time that the cause happens, the effect will happen or that the effect is absolutely necessarily dependent on the cause. Okay? So, analytical a priori reasoning is such that it implies a proposition whose predicate is derived, uh, derivable from the idea of the subject. As in the example, 3 times 5 is equal to 15. Now, 3 times 5 is equal to 15. This, there is a necessary connection between the equation 3 times 5 is equal to 15. Now, according to David Hume, the mind can never find the effect by examination of supposed cause. So the effect is totally different from the cause. So here, when you say 3 times 5 is equal to the effect, the question is, is there a necessary connection between this? Meaning, the, for the effect the effect is totally different from the cause and consequently can never be discovered in it. Okay? Uh, so, we cannot 
see in this kind of reasoning a necessary connection or a causal con necessary causal connection between this uh, a priori reasoning okay so think for example in the collision of two billiards ball the motion in the second ball is quite distinct from the motion in the first nor is there anything in the one to suggest that the motion of the other without the assistance of observation and experience what we see is succession of events ball a moves it's the second ball and the second ball moves okay so according to david Hume, there may be a, a sequence between the two balls but the question is there is is there a necessary connection between the two okay now the question here the crucial point here is what do you mean by necessary connection when we say necessary connection it means that every time a happens b happens if a happens and b does not happen then that means b is not necessarily connected to a because if there is a necessary connection between the two every time a happens b happens every time that one ball moves okay then another ball will move okay so if take this for example can we infer merely from the fluidity of water that it would suffocate a person the fluidity of water would suffocate a person not always all these observations are true in the empiricistic position of Hume, in which any idea is simply a copy of sensation. So meaning, if, for example, say, I throw, I throw something in the air, and it goes down, okay? Or every time I turn on the switch of the light, then the light is on. The question is, is it possible that when I turn on the switch, the light will not turn on? It's a possibility. Is it possible that if I immerse myself in water, in the fluid of water, I will be suffocated? No. Is it possible that when I, when, when, for example, when the, a ball moves and then another ball moves it moves also no then that means while there may be a connection or sequence between the two events it's not absolutely necessary because it's possible that when i turn on the switch light will not be on so there's no necessary connection between the two Okay? And that is what David Hume is critical about. Okay? All we are seeing is a succession of events. Okay? And when A happens, it does not always follow that B happens. Or if B happens, B happens because of another event, not necessarily A. Maybe C. So if B happens, because of C, not A, then that means there's no necessary connection between A and B. Okay? So, this is what Jung is critical about. The, the, the affirmation of the necessary connection between the cause and the effect. So, the idea of the motion of the first ball does not contain anything to suggest the motion of the second and the idea of water does not include a priori the fact that it would suffocate a man or that the idea of 
uh, switching, you know, turn on the switch, and the light going on does not contain, does not suggest a necessary connection between the two. So the necessary connection upon which the principle of causality is based, which the principle of causality is based, is not demonstrable according to Hume, even by experience. So remember that for David Hume, if we can trace it back to an experience, then an idea is illegitimate, invalid, and useless. Okay? So, any fact, for example, the striking together of two billiard balls, or any other fact to which we apply the principle or the concept of causality, indicates to us nothing but the constancy of the contiguity in succession of two objects. What do we mean by constancy? By of contiguity. That there is a constant succession of events. That there is a constancy of the succession of turning the switch and the light being on. And the constancy of the succession of events of A, bell A happening and B moving. Or the constancy between the succession of A and B, etc., etc. Okay? So that is what we are seeing, not the necessary connection between the two. Okay? So the stable union does not show me any necessary connection between the two. In the supposition that it has been observed by me and others, that fact B is constantly conjoined with its antecedent A, this constant repetition does not authorize me to say that in the future, B will always follow from A. That the light being on will always follow from the switch. Okay? Or that, uh, say, uh, when I go out during summer, summer days, then I will perspire. But what we can observe is that every time I go out during summer, very hot day, I perspire. Okay? So if, if we cannot trace no, uh, a real experience, then there's no, there's no necessary connection between these two, these two events. Of course, when we use the, the example of going out and perspiring, it's already a matter of fact. Okay, so we're not saying that that's based on the principle of, of causality. It's not a principle of causality because it's a certitude based on facts. Okay, <clears throat> and principle of causality is not based on experience. It is simply based on the succession of events. So, uh, Yumi states, the repetition of perfectly similar instances can never long give rise to the original idea, different from what is to be found in any particular instance. Not even our activity and the effect of the will upon the movements of our body and our spirit can give us the impression of causality. No relationship is more inexplicable than that which exists between the faculties of thought and the essence of matter. So for you, the idea of causality arises from a psychological fact formed in the following manner. Because here, although Jung is critical of the idea of causality, I'm sorry, of the notion, meaning of the necessary connection of the uh, principle of causality, he cannot deny the fact that we have the idea of causality, that we believe in causality. But how did we arrive at this idea of causality? Even if we cannot experience the necessary connection from which this principle of causality is based. According to him, it is based on a psychological fact which we form in this manner. Okay, so first, experience has shown that fact B has constantly followed fact A. Okay, 
That's the uh, constancy of succession. This stability never contradicted by experience <coughs> shows indeed that the two facts, A and B, are associated with one another so that the one evokes the other. Uh, Jung explains this through the principle of association, okay? Uh, one of the principles in his theory of knowledge. Through force of association, there arises in me the trusting expectation and therefore the habit of expecting that in the future and necessarily granted that A, no, fact A, no, happens, then B must follow. So I always expect that since you know, this an, an, a constant repetition, you know, a constant repetition of these events, successional events, then every time A happens, I expect that we will happen. And therefore, the necessary connection is not a bond which regulates reality, but it is a manner of feeling on the part of the subject, on the part of us. So there's no connection that we can see in the facts A and B, but the expectation, the necessary connection is formed by us. It's in the part of the subject. So a new law by which the subject places in regard to his impression. So I observe this, A happened, then B happens, A then B, A then B. So I develop now that expectation, the habit of expectation that when A happens, B will follow. But there's no evidence that there's a necessary connection between A and B. That's how we form the idea of causality. Now, his critique of substance. So, similarly, we feel this irresistible and universal conviction that brings us to believe in a world of being separate and distinct from the subject. There must be something that is different from us. Now, question is, is that conviction about a world of separate beings, the world of substance, rationally justified? According to David Hume, no. There's no rational justification for this notion of substance. If the immediate object of our knowledge is impressions, there's nothing in them to justify the affirmation that outside these impressions, there are actual beings corresponding to them. Okay? There's nothing behind the impressions. Well, if you go back to Locke, he said because of his empiricist position, impressions are the qualities are what we find that you know, are, are what th those things that are presented to us. But we cannot go beyond impressions. We don't have impressions of what is beyond. So for example, we have impressions of colors. Like for example, we are seeing something red, round, juicy, you know, taste it juicy, it's crunchy, <clears throat> it's sweet. Those are the impressions that we get out of this object. But we don't have impressions of the object it's in itself. What we, <clears throat> what we see, what we experience are impressions. So according to, to John Locke, well, we don't really know what is beyond or behind the impressions. So we can know, but we cannot deny the fact that there must be something behind the impression because there must be something that will hold impressions together. That something that holds impression together is a substance. But according to, David, to Locke, we cannot know it. That's why the position of Locke is that the substance is something that is behind, but it is something that we cannot know. We don't have knowledge of the substance. But just the same, he accepted that there is something behind impressions, the substance. Okay. David Hume, 
rejected altogether the substance. There's nothing behind the impressions. Okay? So, there's nothing behind the impressions that will correspond, you know, that will sustain the impressions. So, in truth, according to David Hume, if the impression is nothing other than a manner of feeling on the part of the subject, it is not possible for thought to go out of itself. Nor is to recourse to the principle of causality valid, as Locke and Bursley held. For we have seen that this principle, as far as Hume is concerned, has already a psychological value. So there is, we cannot find an original expressions or impressions that will support our idea of a substance. Or, uh, no, sorry, that will support the existence of a substance. But again, just the same. He cannot deny that we have the idea of a substance, even if the substance does not actually exist. So he explains this again in this kind of way, following his uh, explanation about the principle of causality. So the question, how can you uh, explain the idea of a world of beings separate the thing from the subject? A conviction that everyone holds, the idea that everyone holds. So what is this origin of this belief? So again, he goes through by way of uh, how he explained the principle of causality. Many impressions, although intermittent and therefore separate in the state, are presented as being constantly similar. By the law of association, these impressions evoke one another. Okay? So, in order to give itself an explanation for its instability, it's brought to believe that there are impressions, that these impressions are identical, and that therefore beneath them, there is some unchanging principle or something permanent, which gives unity to the sensible data that appear to be the same in impressions. Thus arises the duality of the subject, us as the perceiver and the object. Okay, the object perceived. And furthermore, the concept of substance as the support of impressions. So he follows the explanation of Locke that because of this, you know, this conviction that there must be something behind these impressions, then we accepted the idea of substance. But for David Hume, there is no such thing as a substance that exists to support the impressions. We are only made to believe that there must be something behind the impressions in order to support our impressions. So Jung's destructive criticism to the concept of the material substance is also applied to spiritual substance like the personal ego. The idea that we have a personal ego is not given by any impression, and therefore it is just as invalid, as fictitious, and as useless. Its origin is due to the behavior of the impressions themselves. We can only you know, affirm the succession of impressions, which, to the law again of association, are gathered together into either, ever larger groups. So thought is then induced to conjure up a subject, this is now the ego, which unites all these groups. Thus may be likened to a stage in which impressions follow upon the recall of, and follow and recall one another. Therefore comes the idea of an ego, of the spiritual soul, which of course the Cartesian accepted as the primum motto. So, but not only is this ego non-existent, it is one of the many fictions of thought advanced as a means of understanding impressions. So, the only significance of this ego is to serve as something on which our impressions can stand on. But in reality for the video, that ego does not exist, just like any other substance.
So therefore, Hume arrives at the denial of all the basic concepts of scientific and philosophical knowledge. The so-called material and spiritual substance are only aggregations of impressions and ideas. And the most basic principles, like the principle of cause and effect, are reduced to psychological fictions, which are explained through the mechanism of association and habit. Theoretical and empirical research concludes with the collapse of all rational understanding, and therefore it leads inevitably to skepticism. So I will stop there my presentation of Hume's critique of traditional metaphysics. Okay, so that ends my uh, presentation of Jung's critique of traditional metaphysics, particularly on the notion of substance and the principle of causality.